Well, good afternoon, IMAA members, and thank you for joining us for this very, very special uh, and important session. This webinar is titled Pandemic, World Wars, Biblical Floods and More. It's, um, it seems like every time we turn the news on, there is some sort of other disaster or something pressing down upon us, waiting for some sort of comet heading towards Earth. And it's never been a, a more important time to sit down and have conversations about how do we deal with possibly the craziest time we've ever seen on, on this planet. Um, we have the pleasure of Dr. Norman Swan, who's going to lead this webinar uh, from Tonic Media, uh, Tonic Media Network, who is a proud partner of the IMAA and supporter of the independent network. A brief introduction to Norman, who's going to take care of um, the formal introductions of everyone else. But Dr. Norman Swan is a multi-award winning broadcaster and journalist. He started his, uh, his time as a physician and then moved into journalism. He's the face of Australia's uh, analytic aspect of the pandemic and also one of the most recognised and trusted voices within Australia when it comes to medicine. He is the host uh, of Australia's top, roasting, top rating podcast, Coronavirus, as well as a regular appearance on the 7.30 Report, News Breakfast, The Project, Four Corners, ABC Radio, and much, much more. He's the founder of, of Tonic Media Health, and uh, I don't know how he finds the time to do all these things in between, but I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Norman, to introduce everyone else, and thank you for your time. Thanks very much, Sam. And before I set the scene, I'd like to throw to Jake Thompson from Tonic, who runs our Aboriginal Health Television Network, to acknowledge country. Jake? Yeah, uh, thank you, Norman. Yeah, as Norman said, my name is Jake Thompson. I'm a Radri Gibber. Or Gibber in my language means person. And I belong to Billigalari. Um, Billigalari is also known as the Loughlin River. That's been the lifeline for my people since the beginning of time or time of memorial. I want to pay my respect and acknowledge every single you know, city that you guys are in and those ancestors who have cared for Mother Earth who enable us to live among some of the most beautiful cities in the world. <clears throat> I then again want to extend that acknowledgement to any of the elders, if anyone was in this room or you guys work with any of them, because it's those people who allow the Aboriginal Health Television Network to do what they do and what I get to do every single day. I um, also want to extend that respect and acknowledgement, you know, to each and every single person here today because, you know, it's the unwavering support and, you know, dedicated work that you do to mental health um, and, and all other aspects of health that are going to create change for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So um, thank you very much and um, allow me to do that acknowledgement, Norman. Thanks very much. And I'd like to acknowledge that I'm sitting in um, or standing on Gadigal land, part of the Eora Nation, and I too pay my respects to any Aboriginal people uh, watching and um, to elders past, present and emerging. And certainly Jake is one of the emerging leaders of the Aboriginal community in Australia. Look, so the format here is that we're going to have a panel discussion and uh, hear um, from them and then take your questions, put it in the chat box on the right, bottom right hand side of the uh, screen and I'll come to them either in real time or as we um, or towards you know towards after about half an hour or so we'll, we'll come to a more formal session um our participants are professor francis k lankin who is professor of psychology at the university of newcastle pro vice chancellor there too um and uh, have, uh chair of the national health medical research council's women in health science and specializes in um research into a lot of treatment areas um, and prevention areas in uh, in, psycho in psychology, mental health, mental health issues, substance use, and so on. Um, Jackie Alley is here with us, who's Chief Operating Officer of the Media Store, and I am AA uh, board member, chair of the newly formed Diversity Council at the IMAA. Uh, 2021 was the Women in Media finalist for both People and Culture and Champion of Change. As a qualified counsellor, an HRM practitioner, and mother of four. And uh, Ian Hickey, who is Professor of Psychiatry at the University of Sydney, one of the founders of the Brain and Mind Centre, um, heavily involved in research and implementation policy in a wide range of areas to do with mental health issues, with young people, families, and uh, suicide prevention. So that, that's a very high level expert group for you. Please engage on the, uh, uh, on the, in the chat room and we'll come to that as we go. Jackie, um, we're hearing from politicians that the pandemic is over. Try telling that to people in Hong Kong who have got the highest death rate in the world at the moment. Um, China, where it's going into lockdown. But nonetheless, we're going through a bit of a lull at the moment. What's it been like 
in, from your experience in terms of the psychology of it all? Thanks, Norman. Oh, look, I think like everyone, it's been tough for all us, um, all us, whether we're in agencies or other kind of um, industries. I think, you know, we've got a positive case downstairs today. So it's relentless. I think we're all feeling overwhelmed. I think for us in media, I think we're completely fatigued by video meetings and webinars like this. So thanks, everyone, for still staying engaged. I think we're feeling isolated. I think a lot of us are still working from home and missing that um, being together. And those who are starting to go back into the office, I think people are really struggling with those new routines. Um, and not to mention that client service hasn't stopped. We're still pitching. Um, so yeah, it's it's been tough. It's been tough for all of us, I think. What's been the toughest moment for you personally? Oh, for me personally, I think, um, as many of you would know, last year was a tough year for us at the media store and we lost a big client and we had to say farewell to a lot of friends. But I think the defining moment for me in my own mental health rough day, if you like, was when we pitched. We virtually pitched, I think, 10 to 12 times last year, which was relentless and exhausting. And there was one account we really wanted. It aligned to our business values and we worked so hard on it and it was the day we found out we hadn't won that, that um, was probably my toughest day. And I remember turning, I'm actually in my bedroom, I remember falling down on the floor behind me. And at that moment, a friend reached out because um, she was checking in, had we heard, had we heard. And in that moment, I had that choice around, do you be honest and vulnerable or do you, you know, hide from it or avoid it? And I chose to be honest and vulnerable. And I think that was a bit of a defining moment for me. And also I shared, then shared that with my agency on Are You OK Day around how I got through that and my choice to be vulnerable um, and my choice to be human in that moment to say this is how it affected me. And um, I found that that vulnerability um, was incredibly well received and quite powerful. And um Last year, for I'm not sure you know um, Dr. Swan and some of our panelists, but for those on the call, there was the mentally healthy group that many of us are aware of, and they did a study with Never Not Creative, which is a creative agency, and it was a global study last year, and they looked into how we're all coping, whether we're in creative agencies, media agencies, or marketing teams, and what came out, uh, what our people were asking for, and this was last a few a few months ago, the latest report came out was, you know. They love all our tactics that we're all doing, you know, our care packs and our yoga sessions and all of those wonderful things that all of us agency leaders are doing. But what they really want is empathetic leaders. And I think for me, um, that's where we've decided to show up for our people of, you know, bringing that balance between leading them and directing and reassuring. And then also that human to human, you know, we're all having better days than, you know, not so better days and just being honest with each other, I think. That's my long-winded answer. No, no, not at all. But when you say empathetic, sometimes um, it's hard to be authentic. Yeah. You, know, you, you can have false empathy, you know, and, and people can tell and look in your eye. Yeah. Can, can give a shit, but they're, they're saying the right words. How do you, how do you make that? How do you personally make that empathy authentic? Because yeah. it, it's not just boss or leader to the team. It's yeah. also within teams as well. Yeah, that's a good question. I think for me, it's really around speaking less and listening more. So for me, it's just really around asking those curious questions about how they're really going and how the kids are going. Or, um, you know, we had someone off last week with a household of sick kids and, you know, how can we help? Um, so I think it's really listening rather than assuming anything. <laughs> Um, and how what each individual needs from us at that time will vary. And I think, as I alluded to before, it's also about being willing when they ask you to not give the quick answer of, oh, I'm doing fine or everything's okay, to actually saying, you know, this is how I'm showing up today or this is how I'm feeling today. So it's about being, you know, reflecting that honesty back. So I think it's really around not making an assumption of how someone may be coping, but, um, but truly trying to be in their shoes, really. Yeah. Francis, it's just one thing after another. So we've had the pandemic. 
well, in fact, we have bushfires. And, and these things affect the national psyche. I mean, it's not just a bushfire on the south coast of New South Wales. It, it affects the national psyche. You then have the pandemic, which just seems to go on. And despite the politicians saying it's over, it's clearly not over. And every single person on this Zoom knows it's not over. And now we've got a war in the Ukraine, which is affecting us all emotionally day by day. I mean, some people watching, I, I wonder, you know, how much can you take here? Well, and I wonder if the added layer of being in media and having to actually plug into these events as part of your profession um, and part of your job adds even more stress and exposure to sorts of things um, than, than the rest of us out here in, in other parts and other sectors um, might experience. Because one of the things that we... Francis, can I just interrupt you a second? Can you just make sure your volume is right up because you're a little bit low on volume there? That is the first time anybody has ever said that to me. <laughs> Anyway, carry on. Sorry to interrupt. Not at all. Is that any better? Yes, a bit better. Okay. Um, yes. So I think um, one of the things that we might say in these um, in these sorts of situations as, as psychologists and psychiatrists is unplug a little bit from what's going on and, and give yourself that time and space to create a little safety net at home where you're not constantly monitoring and tuning into what's going on in the world. But I would imagine that's almost impossible to do um, in media and in marketing and in, and, in, and in the fields of people joining us today. So I think that adds another layer of complexity and intensity to the experience that, that um, everyone here today might be, um, might be going through. Added to the fact that living with uncertainty and so much uncertainty is really hard. As humans, we crave information about the future in the same way that we might crave food or other sorts of rewards and our brains really perceive ambiguity as a bit of a threat because we're kind of programmed to try to make sense of the world and that affects our ability to plan for the future. So we plan for the future based on what's happened in the past and at the moment it's all over the shop and it's you know unpredictable and that creates this real level of ongoing stress and anxiety and worry and to a certain extent we're powerless to do anything um, about it on a, on a biggest on a big scale. And the result of that is what? Well, the result of that is um, probably what we're all feeling now, which is utterly exhausted, um, unable to suck things up in the way that we might ordinarily suck things up, probably unable to even do the normal things that we might feel like doing, which might be the things that can help get us out of it, like exercising, like connecting with people. Um, like, uh, you know, um, taking care of ourselves and, and putting the extra effort and energy into doing those sorts of things. And that leads to um, things like depression, anxiety disorders. It can increase alcohol and other drug use. And I think we're starting to see those sorts of impacts flow on and, and affect um, Australians, particularly our young people, but people all over the world. I, I mean, one of the words that I think has a lot of bullshit attached to it is resilience, which tends to think, you tend to think that there are, strong people and weak people in the world. And if I'm reacting like this, I'm, I can't be very resilient. I, I, I mean, are some of the words that we use making it worse, like resilience? Oh, look, um, resilience is one of my most hated words. Um, and, uh, and also uh, one of my new favorites is toxic positivity, because I think a lot of it, what we see when we hear people talk about resilience and, and being positive is really invalidating to the realities of what we're confronted with right now. And that's what I loved about what you said, Jackie, um, in, in talking about just being authentic with how you're feeling at a you know, particular point in time, because we are humans in these roles. Um, and, and so I think for me, resilience, well, the definition is, are you able to, to overcome adversity? And the best way to predict whether you're resilient or not is if you've already come over, overcome adversity. Now, nowhere in that definition of resilience does it say how you're supposed to overcome adversity. And certainly cracking hardy or being positive or, you know, not being vulnerable doesn't come into the definition of resilience. It's actually drawing on what's helped you get through tough times before to help you get through this tough time. Um, and the well, people, and when there are a whole heap of different ways in which people can do that. We'll come back to solutions in a minute. I mean, Ian, you talk a lot about psychological distress. And in fact, you and your, the modelers, the Brain and Mind Centre predicted an, epide you know, an epidemic curve of psychological distress. What's it look like? So just to get so that everybody watching can get it in a sense of 
what they're sharing with the rest of the Australian community, particularly the younger community? Well, as you know from uh, your work, Norman, you predict things, what will happen if you do nothing, and then what might happen if people do stuff. So as your work with the coronavirus and others, and I saw somebody recently in the press, why don't all you people apologise for the predictions you made that if you did nothing? Now, Australia did a lot of things around the virus to contain its spread. We actually did a lot of things around psychological distress, most important things, things like job keeper and job seeker. And although governments were slow and didn't do everything and could have done more, we did do a lot of positive things. However, what we did predict, guess what? It's happened. So there's been a 25% increase in anxiety and depression in a two-year period worldwide. Globally in Australia, particularly in young people, which we particularly predicted, anxiety and depression have gone up. Presentation of emergency departments, suicide attempts have gone up. Fortunately, suicides per se have not gone up. But governments have done a lot too, just like we didn't have a complete virus meltdown from doing nothing. When we did stuff, you had less impacts, but it matters. So because the two fundamental things that underpin our emotional health and well-being were undermined, one was personal autonomy. You couldn't go and do what you wanted to do. You couldn't lead your lives. You couldn't be productive. The other was social connection, which was really undermined. So we had this really major threat to our normal emotional and well-being because two of the pillars of that fundamentally got chopped down by the necessary public health response, and I say it was necessary, to the viral threat. And I mean, if you weren't anxious in 2020, March 2020, were you alive? I mean, really? Were you alive? I mean, really? There was really unpredictability, didn't know how bad it would be, really bad situation coming out of China. We saw disasters in Europe and Italy and Spain. If you weren't anxious when that arrived in Australia, I don't think you were alive. So that normal upkeep was appropriate. As Francis has said, what really matters though to psychological well-being along with autonomy and is chronic unresolved stress. And this is chronic unpredictable. So we have this ridiculous thing at the political level, snap back, it'll all be fixed. It's over. It's over. It's over. You know, because then unemployment will be fine. The economy is safe. Thank God the economy is safe. We all snap back. Well, that isn't happening. I mean, so that kind of stuff actually was not helpful. And the, the political sense that this would be the hope that was required, the positivity that was required, pick up friends with was incredibly toxic. On your point about resilience, which I think is really important, it's a crap personal concept. It's really a social concept. I mean, it's always good to talk to ex-prime ministers. They're so much better when they're ex than when they're real. In a conversation with an ex-prime minister on our podcast, we talk about we're all vulnerable. At the individual level, we're all vulnerable. Malcolm Turnbull talked about becoming depressed himself. He never thought he was until he was. You know, the, the vulnerability in the wrong situation at the wrong time, vulnerability characterizes us all. It's called being alive. The community response, how we respond in groups, is really at the heart of resilience. And all the issues we're facing now, not just the COVID response, the physical destruction, the bushfires, the floods, is around how communities respond, how in our families, our social groups, in this case, your businesses, collectively you share the vulnerability and then respond positively or productively, obviously through engagement, through doing stuff you can do, that which you can do and engage with. Then people feel a lot better because guess what bad stuff is going to happen a great cartoon i had as a junior psychiatrist said life is tough and then you die right i mean life is always tough and challenging that's not the question other stuff is still going to go wrong as you say norman clearly the pandemic's not over the challenges associated with climate change i think even the prime minister this prime minister said the other day australia is a bit of a hard country to live in you know yes we face challenges the world situation is very unstable we all know that that's not the question. The question is collectively in our families, in our communities, in our groups, how do we support each other, given we're all vulnerable, to actually cope best with the challenges we face through engagement, not through hopelessness, motivation. And, you know, fatigue is really the characteristic of chronic stress, of long term unresolved stuff, as distinct from being energetic, which is the, oh, well, we'll get up again today and we'll do more again, despite the fact we face many challenges in our businesses, in our families in our communities. And Jackie, you can only do what you can do in the context of the workplace because you're only a small part of the community. Correct. And I think for us, you know, we've, we're continually listening, asking questions, what can we do next? We've done everything from, you know, Slack channels and jokes of the day and, you know, tried to keep morale high as well as those personal check-ins, which I think are even more powerful actually to, you know, let's try and think of the things we are grateful for and, you know, try and, you know, remind ourselves of those things. But we are limited what we can do and we're, you know, and we've got people within our businesses that live on their own and then we've got people that are in family context. To your point, Ian, you know, 
as families and as groups of people, we can support and connect with each other. But if, if your only group has been via online portals like this, it's a very hard place. So I think it's been the responsibility of agency leaders to be aware of that and to be making sure we're connecting in a far more personal way than we've ever had to. Now, I really encourage you to ask questions, make comments coming on the chat room on the side. Um, also about, you know, you may have concerns about your children and um, not just you, you, but your family too, and we can t take those on board. Um, and, and I know that some of you, particularly with adolescent, young adolescent kids are wondering about just stopping them watching the news at night at the moment um, with uh, the Ukrainian crisis on. Francis, why not just talk us through, you did this on Coronacast a couple of weeks ago for me, but you know, more as, a lot has happened since you, you came on. Just give us a sense of strategies that you can start. You know, this is not a leadership seminar. This is for people at the front line, personal strategies moving forward that you can, that will help. Thanks, Norman. My strong recommendation and suggestion is to try to do what we can to create a little bubble of certainty and safety around ourselves or our families or even time in the workplace. And that can, that sounds a bit wanky and, you know, psycho babble, but, um, but really that's that at the core of the sorts of things that um, I'm about to suggest. So one of the things that we want to do is try to create a bit of predictability in our days. And, um, and it's almost like we want to put into place these kind of stability rocks or foundations in our day. So that can help us um, know if we build these routines and they can just be things like waking up at the same time every day, eating regular meals, going to bed at the same time, doing a bit of exercise every morning, maybe reaching out to one friend each day. It just creates that little bit of stability, predictability and routine. I know it sounds boring, but that's the foundation upon which we can then, I guess, take it, take a bit of a breath and then start to do some of the other things. Um, and so those routines and rituals are really important to make sure we reintroduce, particularly then if they become routine, they won't take as much energy and attention and time to do. The other thing we need to try to do is to not actually avoid doing those sorts of things that are good for our health and well-being, because um, avoidance actually feeds the uncertainty and feeds the anxiety and feeds our worries. And so in some, some situations, just forcing ourselves to do one or two things that we might not want to do or that we might have been avoiding doing um, can actually help to start build some us to build some confidence um, and and a bit of so again. Give me an example of that. So, so this is where you've been procrastinating. You don't want to do something, what, and you feel crap because you because because of that or what? Yeah, well, um, one might we could use an example of um, not going back to the gym when it's something that we've done regularly in the past, Norman. I can't um, imagine <laughs> why you're saying that. <laughs> Well, just if I, if you'll allow me, uh, not, this is not to say what's going on with you, but often if you're avoiding doing something that you would ordinarily do and that you would get some joy or some achievement or some benefit from, but part of the reason you're avoiding that is a fear that over time might become a little bit irrational or out of proportion to the avoidance, then the act of avoiding going to the gym like, kind of reinforces the worry and the uncertainty and the unpredictability of, of the world. So just by, with controls, getting you to, to build up a bit of a, a staged return to the gym can give you the information that, for example, that you can re-emerge into the world, resume some of those normal routine and um, things that give you a bit of strength and dare I say resilience, um, and, uh, and can actually then fly in the face and, of the anxiety and the worry that you might've been feeling about re-emerging into the world or about doing things um, that you used to do before COVID and those other sorts of things hit. Ian, what are the warning signs that you may need to do a little bit more than that. So life should be pleasurable. Okay, when people lose the pleasure out of everyday life, you know, lose hedonism, so we have the technical term anhedonia or loss of hedonism, when you notice actually nothing's pleasurable, it is continuously tired. Pick up Francis' point, you've lost interest, you've lost motivation in doing things. And often associated with that, and really a big problem in this particular area is we are actually 24 hour beings. We have 24 hour cycle of activity and then sleep and then restorations. You get up the next morning, okay, but energy can start again. When one day runs into another and you really can't tell 
but the morning they've got activity, you've got energy, you've got, you've got willingness and motivation to do things, couldn't care less. And nothing really good has happened. When that persists and often association with that, people's sleep wake cycle changes, they then withdraw, they're not responding. It's kind of interesting, people have been at home a lot with each other to observe each other's behavior. You know, people's loss of interest, their disengagement. What Francis is talking about earlier on is people's disengagement from what was previously pleasurable, previously whatever, you know, just sort of on the couch, you know, just sort of withdrawn. Don't really care about the things Jackie was talking about, the things that would normally motivate you to go chase those contracts or chase those opportunities and engage with others with energy, with pleasure, with desire. So I think the, the problem at the moment, which is the sort of public health message was kind of don't do anything, which is okay for a moment, but we are not suited to not doing anything. We actually need to do things in 24 hour cycles of activity, of engagement, of pleasure, doing good stuff, and then of sleeping, restoring and being energy again. So loss of that Norman and that withdrawal and loss of interest. So not just the emphasis I think there's been on anxiety and worry or distress, but actually when I start to worry, it's the people who've withdrawn, who are not connected. So in all these Zoom things, and Jackie was talking about, it's the people who are not there. It's the people who are not ringing. It's the people who've disappeared. And then they've disappeared often, and in France is one of favorite areas, into alcohol and drug use, into other disturbed eating behaviors. Stuff People have retreated into stuff in their own home some of which is, I must say, in young people then being observed by parents, students who come home and go, you know what? My son, daughter's got an eating disorder. My son, daughter's got a drug and alcohol problem. So we've seen increased referrals of that because of people observing Norman, some of the more obvious behavioral complications of that. But it's really that kind of not so much causing trouble, but the withdrawal from engagement that I think people need to be concerned about in people who are previously professional, engaged, energetic. So, Francis, what are the when, when you've got to that stage? What are the what are the interventions that make a difference? I mean, you've talked about prevention, which is the things you were talking about a, a, a moment ago. But what can be done? And I'll come back to some digital solutions, which Ian's working on as well. But do you, do you just want to talk about what options are available to you? Because there, there are a few. There are a few, and I think the if I'm to say exciting, it's because I'm a nerd who's interested in research about alcohol and other drugs, Ian, we should clarify. Um, yeah. that, um, <laughs> never tried to touch the drop, ever. The best, the best researchers are engaged with the topic. No comment. Um, I'm going to avoid talking about that. But um, is that we already know what to do to help people manage anxiety, to help people manage depression, and to help people manage alcohol and other drug use. We've got treatments that work, and they are treatments that are, you know, can be a combination of medication, um, of cognitive behavior therapy, so working with people's thoughts and their behaviors, um, and also uh, a lot of, um, I guess, reflective practices like mindfulness and meditation and those sorts of things to help us, I guess, chill out and take time out where we might not be able to automatically do it. And we can access those through our GPs, a referral, any psychologist in any in any part of Australia will be able to do a, a deliver a cognitive behaviour therapy for depression, for anxiety, for substance use. We've got some amazing online programs that help teach people to be their own therapist, if you like, and work through some of these strategies as well. But really, the, the content of therapy, the, the treatments that are available, helps people just to, to think, at, look at their thoughts, look how their thoughts are affecting their behaviours and their feelings, and to identify where it's possible to make some changes. And it's really a lot, um, a lot easier, I guess, than most people think once they've been able to start talking some of those thoughts and feelings out loud, because the hardest part is to, is to deal with it when it's all inside your head. I mean, one of the issues, if you're a workmate of somebody and you know they're in distress as part of the are you okay, is, and the fear of saying something is, first of all, can you, can you make it worse? And second of all, you don't know what to do next and you don't want to become, you can't become their therapist. Oh, absolutely. And I think um, that's probably one of the things we need to work a bit more on in psychology, particularly, is just showing people how it's a bit different from having a, a supportive conversation with friends and family, which is really important. Often that's the gateway. But the first thing to understand is talking about feelings, including about feelings of self-harm and suicide, doesn't actually make those feelings worse 
or make a person more likely to follow through on those sorts of thoughts and feelings. They're already there. They're already in the person's mind. You're not putting them in there by asking people directly about them. And in fact, sometimes it can be such a relief for somebody else to put some words to all of this stuff that's going on in people's minds um, uh, when you have those supportive conversations. But before you go and have that conversation, do a little bit of Google homework and, and try to work out what you might do if your suspicions about a person are, um, are, are born out in that conversation. So it might be, um, Look at, it, look at who their GP is and maybe look at some local psychologists or psychiatrists. You might be able to help them help people follow through with on a referral. If things get very distressing um, in the moment and we need crisis intervention, there are helplines like Lifeline to deal with those immediate crisis situations. But we shouldn't be dealing with these things on our own and certainly having a few ideas or services that we can link someone up with in the context of that discussion can really help um, that person engage with services. And I'm sure Ian's got some great suggestions there as well. I'll come to you in a second, but there's an alphabet soup of psychotherapies. Oh yeah. Some of which are quite nutty and some of which are evidence-based. How do you know which are which? That's a great question. Um, so I think anything delivered by Ian or me, you can trust. Uh, no. So what we want to be doing is looking for um, therapies like cognitive behaviour therapy. Even though it might not be offered in a, say, a computerised package or an app or whatever, um, that this, the cognitive behaviour therapy is the gold standard for treating um, depression and for uh, treating anxiety and also substance use disorders from a psychological perspective. Um, other forms of, of evidence-based and tested therapies include um, acceptance and commitment therapy. But um, so there are all these sorts of therapies, as you're saying, but one of the main things to, to do is to um, look for accredited practitioners. So you can go to the Australian Psychological Society and find a psychologist in your area who deals with the things that you're concerned about, and you'll get sp um, spat out people who are registered and accredited and have to keep up their training and commitment to evidence-based practice in the delivery of their, um, their psychological treatment. And the same is um, true for, for psychiatry. Yeah. Yes, I think you're raising a really important issue to start with, Norm. There's, there's a role for all of us, not sort of, are you okay? Like, are we okay? Like, everyone's been under a lot of pressure. There's a lot of mutual support stuff that's important to all of us. And we should encourage that, the connection and doing things together, exercising together, being together when we can in between lockdowns and isolation stuff. So actually that broad level, and that is what we all need, but it's not the same as interventions that are quite specific then for problems. They're different. And there's a lot of confusion in our area. So as much general support, great. Then accompanying each other to find out more. And I'd very much encourage people locally to find out wherever they are, what is good. We share, and credit of you, Norman, through all of our health information channels and sources, what's good. I mean, Norman and I ring on each other all the time. Do you know the best cancer specialist somewhere or stuff we need? Do you know the best heart person you need in the medical orthopedic stuff relevant to our age and situation? People need that information. Who is good? Who is skilled? And then what they do. So the question I'd ask them all is that this is a consumer choice thing. What does that person do? What is the skills? Like, what am I going to learn that my mother doesn't know or my sister doesn't know or my wife doesn't know or somebody else doesn't know that I'm going to learn that is relevant to my problem? I don't have a generic thing. Some people will have traumatic experiences. Some people will have complicated drug and alcohol experiences. Others, the things I'm interested in, they have body clock type disturbances. Others will have a particular thing. Other eating disorders, another good example. They're not generic. They're quite skilled to get a treatment. So one of the frustrating things in our areas, lots of people have had something, not sure what it is, and it hasn't worked. You go, what was it? They go, I don't know. It's whatever that person said it was. So we say, look, when you go, find out who's good and what they do, and then what it's supposed to do. What is it supposed to deliver? What's the target? Is it sleeping better? Is it getting out better? Is it control of the eating behavior? So you're clear what it is you're trying to fix in that particular kind of area and how is it that this therapy will do that be it a medication be it a psychological therapy etc and what we don't have normally is what you've alluded to enough sharing of that specific knowledge about what it is and who's good at delivering it which we're more used to in the rest of the health system you and i know norman good treatment from good practitioners fair chance you'll still be alive and well pretty average treatment pretty poor outcomes that's true in the rest of medicine and it's certainly true in the psychological area so, Jackie, I want to move now to children, mm -hmm. adolescents and so on. Um, I mean, what's your observation, talking to friends, your own observations? What, 
what are the challenges there and that, that you're struggling with? Oh, look, I have a range, as many people would. I've got, like, from 11, I've got four, so from 11 up to 19. So the 11-year-old, um, the other night he couldn't sleep because he thought he was drowning, and it suddenly occurred to me that whilst we've tried to avoid a lot of news broadcasts on the TV, clearly he's hearing things. So we had to sit down. Now, I've been really fortunate because a couple of my boys went through the Cool Kids program, which is an anxiety program that Macquarie Uni run. So I use some of those techniques to try and, you know, okay, let's talk about what if a flood came here? What would we do with the likelihood? And we kind of talked him down. And then we had a bit of fun with the kayaks that are around the back and, and we were able to get him to sleep and he was fine. Um, and so I think there's a lot of anxiety for them that I'm seeing. The older ones, the 19 year olds are just going back crazy that they can't get out to the clubs and the pubs that, and the uni. So now we're all locked down again here for a week. So he can't go to uni. So they're not, they're not having those normal social interactions. And I don't know if I speak for a bunch of parents on the call, but the gaming that's, that was um, essential during COVID where we're all locked down and it was their way to connect with friends has now been some behaviours that are going to be hard to break, I think. So those in-person interactions, they're missing. And my fear as a mum is, are they going to be able to pick up those social cues and those non-verbals that we all know are really critical to communication once they get back out there? So I'm seeing a bit of a spectrum depending on the age um, and depending on are they still at home or are they out of lockdown and back into uni and school? Francis? Oh, I really, um, really relate to that experience um, with your son. So my daughter who's 10 is, um, is similarly concerned almost in, in exactly the same way the other night. And so I think, um, you know, young people and, and kids particularly just pick up on the emotion um, of us all, whether it's verbal or, or not. And I do think that um, it's interesting, the gaming question and the gaming issue is a bit of a vexed one for me because I can see that it's been such a tool to maintain connection, even for my 10 year old, dare I say it, who's been messaging friends throughout lockdown. But it also has, you know, that, you know, you're not doing other things that would be very helpful to build some of those real life, real time um, connections and, and behaviours and, and that are important for our longer term health and wellbeing. One of the things that does strike me, though, with young people being a young person myself, which I'm not, <laughs> is that they do, they're very adaptable. So they do find ways of connecting and picking up on each other and support on each other's cues and supporting each other in ways that I, I don't, uh, you know, at my age with my cohort. And so um, I learn a lot from my 14 year old about what's going on with her, her friends, not because they're doing the things or saying the things that I think I'd be picking up on, but they, they've worked it out themselves as, as well. So I think starting to again, encourage that connection with young people and they, they are very good and very quick at learning and adapting and, and reconnecting with their peers. Maybe that's it, there'll be an issue with connecting with other age, you know, other age groups, um, but maybe that's not a new problem either. Um, so I think um, we could probably learn a lot from looking at how our young people um, uh, go through and adapt here. Yeah, no, an 11 year old that I know turned around and said to me the other day, um, well, what if there's going to be a nuclear war? You know, it goes, goes as far as that. I mean, just give us some more, you know, just talk this through. Yep. Well, Jackie and, and uh, Francis both played interesting about floods, which is, I think, one of the greatest cognitive strategies ever invented was the what if. You know, well, what if what happened? In fact, we did see, in fact, at the end of the Second World War, two nuclear bombs dropped, actually. And the world actually reacted to that and particular things, and we didn't. Then we saw 70 years of no, that wasn't. And nuclear weapons have existed all that particular time. And it is so to say it's not possible isn't helpful. It is possible. What would be the likely kind of response to that? What has been the human response to that? We've actually had nuclear weapons in the world for over 70 years. We haven't killed each other all sexually yet. You know, so one of the things I think is a sort of fear of the fear. Oh, my God, you know, what if that? And then a notion that we would not cope. And there's a bit of a problem in the same area, in the climate change area and whatever else, to imply that there's no adaptability or the world has ended in a particular way. So one of the difficulties, I think, of the intergenerational issue going on at the moment is for young people to say, look, you guys have stuffed things completely. The world is over. The planet is dead, and if it isn't dead from climate change, you're going to blow it up, right? Now, this is classically catastrophizing, actually, going to an extreme. The advantage of older people, and, and you know, for those of us who, um, my own mother sadly passed away last year, but she was from the psychologically immunized. Oh, we've seen that one before. Yeah, we've dealt with that. 
We know that. Guess what? Stuff happens. People have coped with the Second World War. People have coped through other particular periods. People have coped with recessions. People have coped with the previous financial crisis. Yes, humans have faced challenges and we face a whole lot now. But on the other hand, we have developed, generally speaking, adaptable responses to that. The issue is to be engaged with the solution to that, not to deny it. The don't look up doesn't really help. You know, if the threat is there, it's real. But actually, how do we engage with that? How do we engage with it in the local areas, like the flood areas, the fire areas? I don't know if you can remember 219. I remember seeing my own kids living in one of those bushfire areas. What if there was a bushfire? That was an important thing to know what to do. In our case, run away. You know, we had a plan about how to run away. You know, so that conveying, there are challenges, but what are the appropriate responses to those challenges? I mean, even saying a nuclear war, what does that mean? Like, what does that mean? Now, what is the likely situation? Nuclear weapons do exist. Humans and mostly in the situation we've got have evolved in ways to potentially. So threat exists. But what do we do in the response to threat locally or by engaging with those political and other social processes that attempt to mitigate those risks? And then, so, you know, not that the what if thing is really strong is to actually think through what are the responses. And then people go, OK, like and kids, in the room, OK. There's some, there are some adults in the room, you know, <laughs> it's not a completely Trumpian universe. It's not a completely silly world. You know, it's likely that for most of the serious challenges that we have faced, and we've had, the world's faced a lot of serious challenges over the last 70 years, we have generally speaking, stumbled our way to the better solutions. But you know, there's it's also not a false hope about that, not a, not a Pollyannaish approach about it. These are serious issues, but we are engaged with them. Now, um, I, I encourage you to come into the chat room in the last few minutes of this with uh, questions or comments that you may have. I don't know whether it's got an anonymous option here, but if you, you know, you're uncomfortable with it, putting your name to it, then just um, put it under an anonymous um, before we, we wrap this up. Uh, Francis, how, how do you know with a, a young person, it's the same question I asked Ian before, that it's more than just having a chat about, look, it was all right in 1945 in Hiroshima or after that, um, <laughs> that sort of conversation where you might need more of an intervention. Yeah. Um, so how do you know? Well, I think for me, it's about, um, it's about the impact on uh, the, uh, the ability of a person or in particular a young person to do the things that are expected of them. So if they're missing school regularly, if they're unable to go to a, their jobs, if they're not coming out and joining the family for dinner, if that's your routine, if they're, if they're regularly not doing the things that they that could ordinarily and reasonably be expected of them. And you're probably also noticing a change that's not related to puberty, which is where we're at at the moment, but just a, a, a it's more of a gut for change in, in the way they are or the way they're engaging with you. Um, then that's the time to really have a talk. And if those things are happening most of a day, most days of a week for, you know, a good couple of weeks or more regularly, and there's no, um, uh, no resolution and no um, fewer good days or, uh, than bad, then that's the point at which we need to get people into treatment, young people into treatment. We can't cope on our own anymore. We've done as much as we can within the family, but if it's having this impact on multiple areas of a young person's life where they would reasonably otherwise engage, then we need to get help and treatment as soon as possible, just to help them before they get into the habit of, of, of not engaging and not being in the world in that way. Um, and there are some other ways that we can really um, support, particularly our young people, to do the sorts of things that Ian was saying, which is really, I'm always joking, but it's really good advice. And so there are three really um, things that we, good things I think we can do at home. So one is to ask those, when they are, those what if questions are asked, to answer them and to work through with them. And as you, you saw Ian work through, there'll be some really practical things that you can do where practically worrying or thinking about will change the, the situation or change the worry. And then there'll be some stuff left over those what ifs that are more, I guess, fantastical or, um, or catastrophic or hypothetical type worries. And for those ones where, you know, there isn't a real practical solution, it's okay to schedule in a bit of worry time every day. It might be 10 or 15 minutes when you sit down and have a drink or go for a walk or, or whatever. And you are allowed to worry about that stuff in that period of time for the day. And I know it kind of sounds pretty simplistic, but often it's those what if worries that can um, intrude on all the other areas of our lives. So to be able to contain the worry just to a set amount of time can work really well. 
And the other thing is to get our kids just, I've just noticed a question in the chat, how do we, um, might we encourage our kids to feel a bit more certain about the future? One of the things I think would be great is to help our kids practice tolerating uncertainty. Um, and I well, know that comes with a bit pretty of, tough. Yeah. We, 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 we all, I mean, coming back to Jackie's point there, right at the beginning, is that uncertainty is the hardest thing of all for all of us. Yeah, but there's uncertainty with everything new that you haven't tried yet. It's just the degree of uncertainty that's the issue. So it could be something as simple, and again, maybe I'm being uh, you know a bit simplistic or wanky here, but you know, cook a new cook a meal that you haven't cooked before, and um, and and start by doing things, you know, just little things like that that you might not have done before, or a new young person might not have done before. Catching the bus home from school and and so forth, and just doing the things that you might need to do to set yourself up for uh, you know, a good outcome. And then at the end, have a discussion. You know, did things turn out okay, even though I wasn't 100% certain? Um, if things didn't turn out okay, what happened? And how might that affect what we do next time? And was there a negative outcome? And did I cope with that okay? So just that little debrief after you've done those seemingly small routine little things can help build a little bit of tolerance of uncertainty and an approach to, um, to problems and new things rather than an avoidance. And one of the things I've taken away from this conversation is that we have ups and downs. We go through cycles day by day, but if things become constant, that's when you really need to uh, you know, take, take note and, uh, and do something uh, about it. Um, and another question here how, for you, Ian, how do we approach colleagues that we're worried about? through the us thing. There's a great study done in the UK a while ago about if you say to someone, look, you don't look very well, you should get care. It's the best way to make sure they never get care. <laughs> As a stick from, I think Jackie alluded to this sort of the general empathy earlier on, we've all been through difficult kind of times. We all seem to be kind of struggling, you know, I'm struggling with in a genuine way. And then to offer to actually accompany people into the process to seek information together. Let's go get more information about what is, I was involved in an argument at home recently about what was at risk alcohol use, right? It's great. I don't know if it reflected what we were doing at the time, but there was some discussion about how much of what was going on was to be willing to sort of join in together about that, seek further information, seek further information. To accompany someone in trouble is really critical as distinct from telling them to get care. Most people who are really in trouble really struggle. There are, my earlier comment, they're struggling to engage at all let alone to engage with the health system or the health, getting health system. So actually accompanying someone, Francis alluded to this earlier on, one of the great things about new technology, the easiest place to accompany people to start with is on the internet, is actually to accompany people to get information. From information, then to survey others. I have people ringing me all the time, ringing each other. Who can help? Who's good at helping? Sharing information. So you're creating the pathway to care and accompanying that person and encouraging their use. An earlier comment, it's not for everyone to become a counsellor or a therapist. You know, it's to simply accompany the journey and then let the professionals do what they do well, but continue to accompany them on that path rather than try and direct them. So I don't really, it's a bit controversial. I don't really like the are you okay as a sort of, I'm fine, but you don't look okay to me type idea. As a sting from in the current situation, everyone is just struggling to some degree. And as we go on that journey together, we share information about I might need it today, you might need it tomorrow. How would we encourage each to do it? And for those we are generally concerned about, how do we accompany them on the journey in the first aid kind of concept until they are in the hands of people who really know what to do? And I might give the last word to you, Jackie, your, your reflections on the conversation you've had. I love that idea of accompanying someone because it comes with no judgment and it comes with a genuine support. And I think over the years, I've felt very privileged to be able to accompany some of our staff over the years who've had real mental health issues and um, and it and it and has been a privilege. Sometimes I've sat in um, in sessions with them. Sometimes they've rung me after the session to let me know what as an employer we can do to support them. And I think that's the real privilege. Um, to your point, Francis, you know, and I was just looking through some of the questions. For me as a mum, it's around creating that certainty or keeping those rhythms that feel normal, but also injecting some new ones. Because to your point, then we're, te we're testing or we're playing with the notion of the uncertainty. So for us as a family, um, you know, when we're in lockdown, we did cooked lunches and the boys looked forward to that. Um, we've started these round the table. What's one thing to be grateful of today? And it can be really small. 
And we've started these new rhythms and routines that are injecting new things and a bit of fun and um, kind of testing that or getting them used to things that, yes, we have the standard things that haven't changed, but here's some new fresh things that kind of complement the fear or the worry. Um, so that's kind of something I've been doing that, you know, how do we keep the current rhythms and then how do we bring some new fresh ones in that, um, you know, do inject a bit more fun and variety, I think, for us all. Jackie, Ian, Francis, thank you very much indeed for giving us your time. Um, we had a great audience for this and uh, they stuck with us and obviously um, got a lot out of it. I certainly did. And I'll hand back to Sam. Thank you very much, guys. Um, and, and to echo uh, Dr. Norman's words, thank you, panelists, for, for your openness and your, your transparency in the conversation today. It's very important. Uh, thank you, Tonic Health, for, you know, for your support of the independent sector. And thank you, uh, members, for tuning in today. If anyone's got any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and we 